uh, and certainly in the, the latter part of 1940 and then into 1941, the Condor is a real problem. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, it surprised me slightly, even though it's a slightly different version of the Condor to the one that they're facing in combat. It's not really that different. It's substantially the same airplane. And so it did interest me that they didn't then send it to Boscombe Down and do a really detailed ev evaluation of, of what its strengths and weaknesses in combat were. Um, and I suspect this is partly because they didn't realize just how similar the military and the uh, airliner versions of the Condor were to start with. I think there was an, there was an assumption that, that this was a, a much more uh, substantial modification of the, of the aircraft. Uh, otherwise, it just doesn't seem to have been thought of, which considering the sort of evaluations they do of captured aircraft later on, it surprised me a little. But anyway, so maybe more research to be done there is to find out exactly what the thinking was. But I certainly didn't find anything in the British archives to suggest, hey, we've got this aircraft here. Have we done any, have we even done any kind of, you know, um, send it to the AFDU and get the, uh, the sorry, the Air Fighting Development Unit and, and get them to sort of, you know, attack it with, spits and hurries and, and see you know what its capabilities are but um yeah so anyway that was that was one thing that that sort of was a little bit of a loose end for me um but 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 that was uh you know how it was um otherwise there have been some there's been quite a lot of published yeah this, and this is a kind of a growth area uh, the growth area of pu sort of published translated uh, luftwaffe and other access military documents so there's some there's there's some quite good books now on called eagles over the sea uh which is just a compilation of co um translated primary documents from uh you know from the kriegsmarine and from the luftwaffe about luftwaffe naval and military air operations um and looking at stuff like that was really helpful for the context and obviously for the detail of, of some of the operations and it's useful to see it from the kriegsmarine perspective as well because we do see this this tug of war over the over the condor uh from the navy and from the from the air force um for in various ways really and who's who's got control of them and who who gets to dictate what they do and you know who's and then you get the sense of both sides, both the Navy and the Air Force ha have their different, they're both trying to talk up their side of it. So the Luftwaffe is, does a lot of kind of internal publicity on how good the Condor is and how useful the Condor is for specifically for air operations. So what they're interested in is going and bombing ships and attacking shipping uh, and doing that kind of stuff and doing it directly. Whereas what the, what the Kriegsmarine really wants is um, reconnaissance and uh, you know, communications with the U-boats and, and helping the U-boats um, fight the war. So you've got this political war and I think the again this is something that you talk about the we're talking about the aircraft but the aircraft is a symbol of this conflict between the Kriegsmarine and the uh, Luftwaffe so there's this whole political stuff there that comes out through the story of the Condor and you know this is covered in in other published work but it was something that I found was um, you can't talk about the aircraft without talking about this this political uh, d dispute and debate that's going on throughout the length of the war and it also means you have to be super critical of the sources because you can't, you know, you read a load of Luftwaffe documents and you think, wow, this is a really impressive aeroplane to do this particular job. But then you see the wider context and it's a little bit, well, these documents are, have a particular agenda and I have to be mindful of that agenda and not just take them uncritically. So yeah, it, it's, in, it's interesting for that process. And yeah, it's, it, it's, you will have to do this for every book, you, every book, but you know, this is a particular issue in this one. Um, and also from the Allied side, usually this is the difficult bit for me, which is I'm writing about Allied subjects and you have to really try and cross-reference and compare from the, from, the, uh, from the other side. So part of the problem when writing about, say, fleet air arm operations in the Mediterranean in 1940, 1941, is they make all these claims for the stuff they do and it's a primary source and you've got to report on that as such, but then 
um, actually, you then talk to the you, you look start to look at the Italian sources and 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 the way that the fleet air arm has reported what they're doing is different from what the Italians say happened. So you have to build all of that in. In this case, finding the Allied stuff to cross-reference was the easy bit because that's the, the archives and the sources that I'm used to. So the RAF operations record books, the fleet air arm, squadron diaries, and things like this. And oh, I'm really sorry for me because I'm going all over the place and I'm not helping you with the uh, with the slides. I'm really, really sorry. Um, uh, please do, um, well, I, you can probably, I'm I should slides up. Uh, you could probably skip through a couple now um, just to get to the, the military stuff. Um, are we going to make the slides available to everyone who signed up? Um, just to um, just so they've, they've they've got the copies when we're skipping past it. Yeah I mean yeah if, if, if people want them I'm, I'm quite I'm quite happy to allow them but it's my fault because I'm I'm not referring to them and I'm darting around all over the place. Um, but but yeah, actually, actually, having said that, this um, this the slide we're on now is is actually quite yeah, it, it uh, it's about where we are in the story, so that's good. Um, uh, and that yeah, that summarises what I was just wittering on about quite nicely. So uh, so there we go. Um, but yeah, I mean the, again, the, the the Allied sources I've tried to include those. So so we've got the uh, and again because this is. This is quite an important part of the story because the the vulnerability of the Condor to the uh, to the Allied response was an important part of it, and then obviously then you've got the way that the uh, the Luftwaffe and the Kriegsmarine respond to this, and it really does circumstances force it from more of what the Luftwaffe wanted to do to what the Kriegsmarine wanted to do, um, and then you've got the Allied response. Which is very much directly to the Condor. I mean, obviously later on there are other other aircraft, but it, it's very much this aircraft, this specific aircraft, and, and the capabilities that it gives the Luftwaffe, which they haven't had before. Um, it, it really dictates this this incredible Allied response of uh, cam ships to start with. So the the um, rocket, the development of the pyrotechnic rocket f to fit on merchant ships. Uh, and then the escort carriers, uh, which um, which carry f carry fighters and so on. Obviously, the main purpose of the escort carriers, sort of later on in the war, is very much anti-submarine in nature, um, and it's sticking swordfish on them with depth charges and rockets and, and anti-submarine stuff. And that's, but the fact that when they they bring them in, HMS Audacity only has fighters to start with, and then you know Avenger on the the PQ-18 convoy, it has a few swordfish for anti-submarine purposes, but it's mainly Sea Hurricanes, and this is because of the Condor. Um, it, you know, it's it's an incredible response, really. But then it, it deals with the Condor, you know, this and other things like fitting heavier anti-aircraft. Uh, armament to um, to merchant ships and and heavier AA on escorts and things like that. It it, it knocks back the Condor quite considerably. And there's a there's actually a really interesting passage in one of these documents which I I will refer to now that that was that's in the National Archives, uh, which is a lengthy series of interrogation reports with um, with crews from KG40 which were were shot down. Um, in some of the earlier operations in in you know late 40 early 41 and captured um and really these guys are spilling their guts um you know i would if i was in the bag um but you know they're giving a lot of information on the way that um that kg40 in particular is operating the way that it's set up and the 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 nature of the operations that they're doing and obviously you have to take a lot of this with a pinch of salt uh, and it has to again you have to cross reference everything because there's stuff that they're saying which you know might be for misdirection and all that kind of stuff but actually it does prove to be a very reliable document and it's very interesting and a lot of the previous material previous sort of published stuff has referred to this you know it goes back a long time kenneth Poole's book from the 60s um references some of it but people tend to re reference it in in little bits and pieces here and there whereas i find the context of the whole thing really fascinating and they're talking about the routes that they take over the uh, over the ocean uh, the flying over ireland the uh, republic of ireland uh, and uh, you know they work out quite early that they can fly over ireland without really much in the way of consequences and you know then you get one or two aircraft crash on ireland 
uh, or either just off the coast or you know one of them flies into high ground in bad visibility in, in on the Republic of Ireland itself which causes a few a few slight diplomatic issues uh, considering it's a, new, a neutral country um, and some of the minutiae of how they operate in KG40 uh, you know it's it's really interesting stuff and it really helps add the other side of things of how they how they operate and one of the things that these um, these airmen are saying is uh, well this is the way we attack this is kind of how we attack the ships and the angles um, and uh, you know if you'd only put a few more 20 millimeter guns on the uh, on the sterns of merchant ships it would be really difficult for us so bingo off they go and start fitting um, fitting 20 mil cannon and then it becomes a lot more difficult um, so you know stuff like that is is was was really useful um, and um, you know, again, there's a lot of original material in the in the in queue because of stuff that was captured and then taken back after the war, uh, including some of the technical stuff. But um, so, uh, what's the next slide? No. Um, ah, okay. Uh, oh, well, illustrations I'll come on to later in a bit, actually, because again, that was. Uh, oh, what the hell, I'll say it now. Um, I have found that uh, doing illustrations for books, particularly for my own books, is really helpful um, because when you're studying something to illustrate it, I do, you know, it works for me anyway, you notice things that you don't. Even when you're studying photographs, uh, you're trying to glean information from photographs, uh, even when you're studying the documents and so on, there's a certain you know when you're working out proportions of things the shapes the sort of you know what this particular bit of equipment is here the length of this extension to the gondola here um you know yeah you know, again i would recommend that to anyone who writes and does their own illustration is even if you're not going to necessarily use the illustrations you know pull all your photographs up everything you can find and you know illustrate bits of the aircraft or the whole aircraft or you know it it, it it gives me a different, it gives me an additional perspective on things anyway, and I notice things I wouldn't have otherwise noticed. Um, so these, actually, this is quite uh, interesting on the, what I was talking about before with the sweep back. Um, so this, you've got the first prototype here in its initial configuration at the top, and then the, um, the initial airliner version as it was converted to military service uh, later on. So that's one of the A series, which was the, the first airliners. Um, so with the slightly more swept back wing and uh, the, if you'll notice there with the nacelles as well which is again something that a lot of the drawings some of them pick this up and some of them don't um, when people do drawings and profiles and things like that which is if you look at the engines and the how far ahead the inner engine is from the outer engine and if we could go to the next next page because I think that had some later slides on it yep there we go the inner engine is quite a lot further forward uh, and they brought this in from the B version, and it then, which then worked onto the C version, um, and things like that. Which, again, I've never, when we're talking about the development of the aircraft, some, again, as I say, some illustrators pick it up, others don't. And, but I've never seen an, a, anyone actually write this down and actually think about, well, okay, so they moved the, the inner engine forward. Why was that? Um, was that for balance reasons? Was it to sort of, was there sort of some impingement between the the propellers on the two engines that was that were causing some issues. I think it probably was for balance and weight. Um, so yeah, so stuff like that anyway, which is um, because this was a subject I was less familiar with to start with, it was interesting to pick up on things like that. So uh, later military service. Um, Again, in terms of finding the sources, finding the documents, similar to what I was talking about earlier with the uh, with the early military stuff, a range of published material, um, primary sources, material in archives, material in archives in the US and in the UK and in some cases other countries. Um, some of the yes, so, ah, so here we are, airlift, the later airlift stuff. Um, again, I found this really interesting because there was a source that um, after the war, uh, the US Air Force, um, who had in the bag a number of, uh, well, you know, they were being released by this time, but they, they had a number of, of um, 
former senior Luftwaffe personnel and they took the opportunity to have these uh, these guys write detailed reports on various aspects of Luftwaffe operations throughout the war as a learning exercise for the Air Force, for the US Air Force. Uh, and as a result, we, we have the sort of, uh, from the horse's mouth, uh, accounts of a number of people. And then again, you've got to be careful with this stuff because some of it is agendas, some of it is, is kind of going to be glossing over some of the less pleasant stuff that was being engaged in. But in this case, we have a document from uh, General Major Fritz Morzik um, on German Air Force airlift operations in World War II. And he was quite a senior um, person who was, he was involved quite heavily with the Stalingrad airlift and the um, Kuban airlift. Now, the Kuban airlift was really interesting because that was this, um, you know, after Stalingrad, the, the Red Army kind of really made huge advances um, and more or less cut off a, a large contingent of um, German forces in the, uh, in the Caucasus. Uh, so an airlift was needed to supply these forces and to bring out wounded, uh, wounded troops. Uh, and even in some cases, there was some quite like the, they brought out a shipment of copper, um, which was obviously raw, raw materials were getting slightly um, uh, scarce in Germany. So you know any, anything in the way of raw materials that they could bring in. But yeah, no, so they they actually flying in supplies to the, the encircled troops and bringing out a shipment of copper. Um, mainly what they were bringing out was wounded uh, wounded troops. But this, this particular airlift was done substantially with Condors. Now, you know, a fair amount has been written about the, the Condors in the Stalingrad operation, um, but actually, you know, they were fairly marginal to that operation. In terms of their what they did, it was relatively minor mainly because the serviceability was really challenging in the conditions on the on the Soviet front. Um, by Kuban, they've brought in, uh, they've managed to bring in a contingent of, of ground staff from KG-40 in France. So suddenly it's a lot more practical to operate the Condors, the, the range is helpful, the performance of the Condor over things like the Junkers 52 uh, uh, is, is important. So actually, this is something that the Condor is, is really pivotal in this this relatively limited operation. Um, but again, this is something that, you know, I, I want to come back to this because we, you know, I think we did it justice for, for a book of this nature in, in the book. Um, added some stuff that I don't think is, has really been heavily uh, analysed on, on in published material before. But, you know, this is something, it's a part of the story that uh, it adds to the to what we know of the aircraft and what we understand of the aircraft. And I think it, it moves it slightly from my feeling about the Condor throughout the whole process of writing the book was we think about it 90% maritime reconnaissance. And I think actually there's a, a bigger chunk of it. Certainly it's strategic transport was really, really quite important in Norway early in the war and then in places like Kuban later on. And then it moves more and more back into this transport role. Um, and again, there's probably more to be written about, you know, the last operational Condor squadron is this Fliegerstaffel Condor, which is a transport squadron. Uh, and it's, it's you know, the, the last remaining Condors are kind of bundled into this one unit doing, doing transport stuff. Um, after they've been replaced finally by this is a long long process trying to replace them with another suitable aircraft and i think it says something for how effective the condor was in that maritime role that it took a long time to find an aircraft that was um that could do what it did and could improve on it which really was the, the yonkers 290 which was not really coming in until sort of 44. um and obviously the attempt to replace, to, to, to equip some of the KG-40 squadrons with the, the Heinkel 177, which never really worked too well. Um, you know, they managed to, to get them functioning a little bit in the anti-shipping sort of towards the end of 43 and, and thereafter. But the reliability with, with that was, was, never, um, was never good. I mean, serviceability on the Condor, let's face it, was, was never 
it was never stellar. Um, but the fact that they always managed to put up enough aircraft to, to, to really be a thorn in the Allies' side for a long, long time. Um, some of the stuff in the Mediterranean is, oh my God, I've gone 15 minutes over time. Am I okay to continue? Yeah, everyone, um, yeah, cool. I guess people... I guess people will just log off if, if they've got somewhere else to be. Um, and, um, you know, some of the stuff about the Mediterranean as well. And one of the things I found, again, from these intelligence reports was the, the sheer importance of the Condors in, in transporting fuel to Rommel for, the, um, for, the, for his spring 1942 uh, offensive, which, again, is, is something that, you know, it's mentioned in some reports, but it was really felt at the time to be incredibly pivotal that they had these aircraft there in the Mediterranean that were they were they were down there for anti-shipping operations and they never quite and for raids against the Suez Canal which never really quite got into this into the swing of things and also um, um, you know Fleeker Corps 10 um, really hated them and didn't want them there and, and they weren't you know they they would they were doing their uh, their anti-shipping stuff with Junkers 88s and um, and so on, and they, they didn't want these condors there, which were too few in numbers, the spare situation was terrible. Um, they, they just wanted to sort of foist them on someone else, and we, you know, what they managed to do was put them in this, in this sort of uh, German-Italian unit for supplying forces in North Africa, where they actually ended up doing really useful work. Um, so this is kind of um, you know stuff like this, which was was really interesting, and you don't know quite what you're going to find when you f when you look for it, um, but which was interesting. Uh, and you know there was a lot of technical material in the Allied stuff. So on this next slide here, um, you know we have this diagram, which is quite well known. It's quite well it's quite well reproduced, but um, I you know I, I wanted to, to reproduce it because it's it's really useful for showing where these additional fuel tanks went, um, uh, which were again based on when they were doing the long range flights, the transatlantic flights for publicity early on. This was kind of where they developed the partly why how they could develop the military version so quickly was because they already had these you know all the drawings and stuff for just sticking more fuel tanks in the cabin. Um, and and you've got the two different forms of the uh, the D stand, uh, which we yeah, have for the forward underneath gun. Um, so so there was the the um, the Icarus version and the Focke version with the lens mount and stuff like that, which you know is is it's a nice illustrative image. Um, and this was actually from the British National Archives. Um, not sure I should say that because. Uh, that one there? No, well, you know, we've got numerous copies of that one anyway, so um, um, it, it was, uh, we're recording this, so it, it definitely wasn't from the British National Archives. Um, and, um, yeah, and, and some of the uh, some of the technical photographs, which I'm really annoyed, actually, because a few weeks ago I missed out on, there was a, this fantastic photo album came up on eBay with uh, original Focke-Wall factory photographs of the first prototype on rollout and during construction, so there's a lot of the construction details. The the price of it just went way out of my range, but um, uh, you know, it, it, it well, and it was too late for the book anyway. But um, so there is stuff like that out there, which is still emerging. So you know, there's more to write on the on the Condor. There's more um, stuff that's emerging. If, you know, photographs. I'll just quickly talk about photographs because one of the things I well, the way I wanted to approach photographs in the book was to do three things. Um, first of all, to illustrate the story that we're telling in text, um, to to uh, to support the story of the Condor in photographs. So to make sure that we covered every aspect of it um, inside and out as much as possible. Um, the second one was to provide really high quality images that show in detail the condor, again, inside and out, so people can really you know, see nice. And one of the things I love about Mortons is their, their, their reproduction of photos is so good. It's a shame not to make use of it. Um, you know, the, the printing, uh, the, the paper they use and the printing and everything is, is so nice. It's just the books are just really attractive. You want to use nice photos. And the third one was to just try was to try and use just try and show a different picture to find some different images that, that hadn't been published before, hadn't been published very often before, um, and 
there's a steady stream of photographs, you know, snaps, snapshots and stuff coming from probably German personnel throughout the war. Um, you know, taking photos of, of, of various aircraft, which they probably shouldn't do on their personal cameras and, and these, these things are coming out and we were able to find, you know, there's a nice a nice one on, well, I mean, in some ways it's a, it's a really poor quality photograph, but it, it's really, now did I, we did have this, oh yeah, on page 91 of the book, which is, it's in, it, you know, it's covered in marks and blemishes and 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 everything. Even with the re all the repair work I could do, it's it's still you know, it's spotty in marks and everything. But it's wounded personnel from the Eastern Front um, being evacuated on the one of the Fliegerstaffel um, des Führers, uh, so VIP transport aircraft really, which was pressed into service uh, evacuating uh, wounded troops from the front line and, and this is actually NKNM I think um, is the is the code and you've got details on there like you've got the yellow band around the, the rear fuselage for the uh, eastern front markings and um, you know the bandaged troops being brought onto the aircraft I think that's just as a snapshot of a moment in time that's it's just really important and it's good to show things like that um, and you know, there's another one on page 85 where, uh, you yeah, know, again, this, that's another one of NKNM, but I don't think it can have appeared in that particular form with the, the pale coloured, I think they're yellow, they might be white, uh, the rudder and the elevators. Um, it must have appeared in that form for a very, very short period of time because there's a, we know exactly when it was it was painted in camouflage um, we, we we know more or less when it had the yellow band that then replaced it as an identify uh, identifying marking it was probably like that for no more than a month I would say um, as far as I've been able to work out but um, yeah um, and also just just quickly I mean one of the other things that I, I was interested to do with some of the again the intelligence illustrations and models so going to page 99 98. I'm really sorry for me. I didn't. I should have, you know, provided this for the um, slides. But you know, just how the how the Allies saw it, how it was seen from the other time, and how the other side, and and the 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 model that they used for the identification photos and the film, the little little videos, not videos as they would have been called then, but the little films that they put together, showing the the aircraft for. Uh, for other airmen and and what they look like from various angles and where the the gun arcs are and things like that, um, you know, because that again that's another side of the story. Um, so that's yeah, um, and I've already talked about the the nature of working on the illustrations and how that feeds into an understanding of the subject. So I think I'm pretty much done in terms of the run through. I'm really sorry for going over time. I didn't realise quite how much I was. There was a lot of ground to be covered, to be honest, so apologies for that. Um, if there are any questions, very happy to take them. Yeah, I was just going to say huge thanks, um, Matthew, for for all the, the fascinating um, insight that you've brought in this and the, and the stories of, of the individuals, I think, that came out. Uh, uh, are really fascinating. I mean, I, I'm not an an expert expert in the in the 200, but I, I've got a I've got a kind of general interest. Anyway, my my wife's grandfather um, was on. Well, he was originally a, an anti aircraft gunner on the convoys, oh, um, wow, and cool. then and then he moved to the escort carriers as an mm. anti aircraft gunner on those 20 right. mil cannons that they added because of the threat of the Gondor. So in mm. some ways, he had a job because of that, um, mm. which was. Uh, which was fascinating. The I think one of the one of the interesting things that I that from what you brought out was was the extent to which you're using uh, primary evidence for for the uh, for kind of as part of your research in terms of the <clears throat> that kind of translation work and how much is kind of intact mm. uh, obviously that, that's available now. How how difficult was that to to access, did it involve a number of trips to Germany to kind of connect with, you know, the, the guys that look after the, the Condor Tempelhof or mm. uh, 
you know in some of those other archives that people have kind of put together was that was there a lot of that or was that were you able to do kind of a lot remotely through covid and things like that I mean, it was well. For, certainly, from my perspective, it was all it was all remotely. Um, again, partly because um, the majority of the work on the of the, the research work on the book was done during the, the pandemic, so there just mm. wasn't the option. Um, but there was, you know, I ha there was, I had an awful lot of support, and I think again because you know uh, the Bundesarchive archive has put masses of stuff online. It's just, it's not necessarily. You know, accessing it isn't the problem. Finding it and identifying identifying it is the problem. It's the organisation mm -hmm. that's the issue. Uh, the issue there. I mean, in terms of the um, the guys who who restored the uh, the condor at uh, Temple off again, there's they were pu pr um, putting a lot of uh, of information on the process on online, um, and it's it's been a very online um, uh, process. There there was um, you know it w it was really uh, it was a lifesaver to be able to see that uh, that that going ahead and and the information from there. And I've got a couple of contacts in Norway as well from from actually when they they recovered it and and, that, and another and another aircraft as well. Um, so so that was helpful. Um, but um, really, yeah, I mean, it was. And also the uh, the, the publishers have they they've been um, having having a lot. Uh, uh, a fair amount of Luftwaffe stuff digitised um, mm. from those from those archives, which is is massively helpful as well. So I've been able to um, work with a couple of other authors uh, who, who are, are doing stuff for for, for Mortens, um, who've been working on that same sort of cache of documents uh, from that German archive. So so there was um, uh, you know some of the the milk papers uh, for you know, Erhard Milk. Um, uh, papers relating to to him were were quite useful in uh, the 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 Fliegerstaffel Condor, the the development of that and and you know where it was going and and just towards the end when they were where they were sending the personnel from it and and where they were sending the aircraft and and those sorts of things. So it was probably a bit more difficult than it otherwise would have been, but such is the nature of things now that. Um, it was possible to to do, you know, it's possible to do that remotely in a way that it just wouldn't have been 10, 20 years ago.